Alright, we're back together, you and me. My name is Carrie, and I'm thinking it'd be cool this time to talk about inspiration and finding your own reference material. We can take a look at some ways to come up with ideas when you need to, and I'll show you some examples of how I do that. Because that's super important for working artists for a bunch of reasons. The first being that if you're going to be ready to make stuff at a moment's notice, working for clients or employers, you need to have lots of things already going on in your head. Things you're interested in, things you know about, things you can make reference to. So that when the client says, hey you, we got this new streaming music service we want to make a commercial for, you're super ready to spray all your uniquely relevant ideas all over the table. Now, when I come across an image I think is really cool for whatever reason, I'll tend to grab it and put it in a reference pile that I look over occasionally and that I go to when I need some inspiration for a project. In some cases, I'll grab it because I like it in its entirety. But that can be a little dangerous because, as you may have found yourself, when you find something you're in love with in every way, you sometimes have to fight the urge to make a copycat version of it for yourself. And you kind of end up doing a knockoff of someone else's work, which ain't great. So I'll save that stuff that I love wholeheartedly, but I won't put it in my reference pile. It'll go somewhere else. But if an image has interesting form, or a cool use of color, or there's some idea I think is super rad, or I know it makes me think of something specific like a certain subculture, or an era, or whatever, then I'll throw it in the reference pile so that when I go ripping through that pile for ideas, they're all there. But there won't be anything I want to copy verbatim. For the most part, the goal is to have a collection of stuff that'll jog your brain when you need it most. So that's really useful because when you do it in small bits, copying is really one of the essential elements of creativity. In simple terms, we copy, we transform, and we combine. Transforming is just what happens when you copy something you did before, but you change it a little bit. And over time, that leads to a kind of slow evolution. As far as I'm concerned, combining seems to be where the big jumps are made. You know, as a creative person, your brain is really good at absorbing stuff you're seeing, hearing, reading, experiencing, whatever, and trying to make connections to things it already understands. Things you saw, heard, read a long time ago. And simply put, that process of making connections is how we form new ideas. So let's try an example. Let's say you're sipping on your coffee and you see an article about some new solid state laser technology. Ooh, the future is all about lasers and lasers are cool. So, you know, what's something else that's cool that we already know about? How about, how about something decidedly not futuristic, something historical? Let's, let's look at the Middle Ages, you know, the era of kings and knights. How, how about knights? Knights are something we know about and are kind of interesting. You could combine lasers and knights and get Oh, I don't know, something like this, maybe? <laughs> and there you go, an idea is born. We combine something we just saw with something we already knew about, and look at that, a multi-billion dollar empire was born. And it paid off to have had those references already floating around in our head. So we were able to come up with an idea by combining what we just found with some knowledge and experience we already had. Now that means several things. It means that if your experiences are unique, then your ideas tend to be more unique, and that's important for your voice as an artist, which is something we'll definitely talk about at some point. If your input is the same as everyone else's, you'll tend to understand things pretty similarly to them. You'll have similar ideas, and your voice as a person and as an artist will be altogether kind of samey. And this is part of the reason why we see trends in design or film or architecture or whatever. Because at some point, someone did something awesome, and a group of people were all like, that's awesome! And then they kind of emulated it. And emulation is great. It's a fantastic, if not, you know, even entirely necessary way to learn. But on the flip side, if you end up following a trend and doing the same stuff basically everyone else is doing, you're going to get lost in the crowd. If you want to get paid to do this stuff, an employer or a client has to have a reason to pick you over someone else. And if you're exactly the same as someone else, the only reason they're going to hire you is if you're cheaper. And trying to be the cheapest is a muddy hole you do not want to crawl into. A big part of your value as a visual communicator is the ability to convey new things or convey old ideas in new ways. So it's super important to be able to generate new ideas and to do it from a unique perspective, which requires a good solid stream of input and experiences. You may have heard the phrase garbage in equals garbage out. 
If you sit in a room and watch reality TV all day, every day for a few years, and then one day you decide to write a short film, what do you think is going to happen? Clearly, you've got reality TV crap on your brain because it's all you've known or thought about for a long time, and that's going to significantly flavor what you end up making. Ideas come when new input mixes with what you know. So if your new input is the same crap you already know, nothing new is likely to come out of you. And if what you know is kind of boring garbage, and the input you keep going after is boring garbage, boring garbage is probably going to come out of you. Garbage in equals garbage out. So the trick is to expose yourself to a variety of things, and in doing so, to happen upon those things you find truly interesting. Find out what you like, but always keep exposing yourself to a wide range of input. What you find interesting is going to inform your unique perspective on things, and exposing yourself to a breadth of input is going to help that perspective to keep evolving to stay fresh and interesting to others. So that's already a bunch of reasons to make a habit out of seeking out new experiences and new input. But what is all this input? Where is it supposed to come from? If you're a graphic designer, do you look at a bunch of graphic design? If you're a filmmaker, do you just watch all the films you can? Well, for sure you want to be studying your craft by looking at the output of others. But looking only at design or watching only films is going to turn into a really narrow range of input over time. So you can fix this by getting away from your chosen craft as often as you can spare. Go to a motorcycle store, hang out in an arcade, See a play, study helicopter engineering, check out a used bookstore, go hiking on the coast, listen to show tunes, read about stem cell research. You know what I'm getting at, have a breadth of experiences. Some of them will immediately mean more to you than others, and that's fine, just let it all in. Give it all a chance to enter the mix of your mind. So that's great, but what do you do to keep the input coming in when you only have short bursts of time, or you're stuck at your desk? Okay, well, have you heard of the internet? It's super cool. Kids are going to be real hot for it really soon. Something I try to do is to stay abreast of things in general. So when I have unstructured free time, I'll look at industry sites and stuff related to what I do, but I'll also check out a kitchen sink site like Reddit, because the fact that it's a dumpster of everyone's interests makes it hard to get anything specific out of it, but it also means you might randomly find something interesting you'd never have thought to look for, which makes searching through all that other trash really valuable. Like, I just found this today. And also this. I wasn't even looking for this stuff, but it's pretty cool. So it may seem obvious, but this is really an easy way to stay on top of the long game we were just talking about. You're finding out about the world and looking to update your understanding of it in unexpected ways, so you're not always going back to the same old, same old. You ever met that one person who only seemed to be able to talk about like football or clothing or whatever? Yeah, you don't want to be that guy. Especially when a client comes to you asking you to do stuff that's in no way related to football or clothing, because you're going to end up taking a huge dump on that job, and then you'll have to clean it up, and there'll be poop everywhere. It's just man, gross and embarrassing. So you're probably already playing the long game, and you're an expert on a few things, while also being broadly aware of the world at the same time. So you have things you're interested in, you know about, you can make reference to. That'll totally help you as an artist overall. But what we're going to do is look at a small sample of sites that are more art specific for when you want random but more immediately applicable stuff. Like when you're handed a project and asked to write a treatment or to make imagery or concept or design something. For example, a site like found.com is a super random flood of visual art curated by a large group of artists interested in photography, architecture, fine art, fashion, film, media, illustration, you name it. They're posting a constant stream of imagery from all over the place, so you're going to see a lot of stuff you wouldn't have known to look for otherwise, and that's going to have the potential to take your head to places it wasn't already. It's a great brainstorming tool, because you can literally take any image here and ask, how could this be relevant to my project? And in trying to answer that question, you're going to start generating ideas you didn't already have, especially when the image seems totally unrelated. So let's pretend we actually have this job to make a graphic spot for a music streaming service. To keep it simple, let's just say it's for a new company and they want a kind of image campaign to brand their service and introduce it to the public. So we go looking through random stuff for something we like and we happen upon this, which I like just for its own sake. It's just kind of cool. I mean, it's really beautiful. At first glance, it has nothing to do with a company selling you tracks to download or whatever. But for the sake of brainstorming, let's figure out how it could be relevant. 
let's force ourselves to make connections between this image and all the things we might want to say about streaming music services. Maybe stuff about technology or sound or performance or being a fan or making an album. So let's look at what's going on here. What can we get out of this image? Well, we can break it down and ask how some of its characteristics might be relevant to what we're doing. Like, okay, there's a girl here and the expression on her face might be either one of agony or pleasure. I can't tell, but you know, pain probably isn't an emotion we wanna to relate to our project right off the bat. So maybe that doesn't help. The painterly quality is really fluid and organic in spots, which if you think about it, is sometimes a quality that music can have, especially freeform music, you know, jazz, performance type stuff, anything live. So maybe that could be relevant somehow as a metaphor or a visual indication of mood. Can we maybe look to the color palette? Yeah, absolutely. I can't think of a reason yet why we couldn't use mostly a white world with some dark organic shapes in it. There's no reason to do it yet, but it's nice. But now that I'm looking at it, one fairly obvious quality is that the composition feels very liquid. You know, the composition might be implying that this woman made of paint or color is washing away. The brush strokes suggest maybe she's being pulled along with the paint as it moves, like, like a river with a slow current. So we could imagine this as a shot taken from directly above a river of paint and as the paint flows through the shot, shapes emerge and evolve and are swept away. You know, faces, objects, whatever we like, really. This woman could be singing as she takes shape and then distorts and flows out of view to be replaced by another face or an image of a performance or someone on their bed listening to music or dancing. We could have an impossible little story of what's literally a stream, get it, of music-related stuff flowing past the camera, all in this world of white and black flowing paint. You could do a whole spot about this liquid evolving series of images, because that's a fairly complete idea right there, inspired by an image that, you know, two minutes ago had nothing to do with streaming music services. And yet by making ourselves figure out how it could be relevant, it inspired some kind of poetic ideas. Okay, cool, let's do it again with a different image. So I kept looking for something I just thought was nice to look at, and the next thing I found was this. So how is this gonna apply to digital downloads or websites or music or any of the other things related to our subject matter? I mean, I, I don't know. Well, what are some of the things that we notice about the image? Aesthetically, the color palette is it was really lovely with these cool blues and some very subtle shifts towards warmer colors back here. And it's really high contrast, really dips into shadow in a lot of areas. As far as what's actually going on, I don't know if this is in space or if it's microscopic or what, but one thing that's fairly apparent is that this ray of light here is really focused on this center blob sphere. It's like among all these cells or planets or whatever they are, that ray of light is singling this one out, like it's been chosen. And that to me kind of parallels what happens when you have a million choices, like on iTunes, and you pick one, you select it. You shine your light on it, as it were, and it comes to life. You know, so what if we think of each of these cells or planets as a song? I mean, that kind of works. They're even clustered together like albums of songs. What if there's music inside of each of these things and they're pulsating very subtly as they float there and you can just barely hear the muffled audio coming from inside and this ray of light is tracking around, probing them, and when it illuminates this one in particular, its beam focuses and intensifies and bursts this cell open, and the music comes rushing out, and there's color and all kinds of whatever. You know, now that I look at it, I think these things are supposed to be cells and planets at the same time, and I, I like the idea that you can't tell whether this is all really huge and in space or it's microscopic and suspended in liquid. There's lots of things we can take as inspiration here, whether it be the colors or the kind of sharp cinematic framing or the idea of songs as clusters of objects being searched and selected amongst. I mean, the point obviously isn't to take this image and apply all aspects of it to our project because that's clearly unethical. This is somebody else's creation. Speaking of, I, I don't know who this belongs to, so if anybody knows, hit me up and I'll give them some credit. But each aspect of it is up for grabs. 
So in most cases, you'll probably draw ideas from multiple sources, in which case sometimes a quick mood board can be helpful just to see those ideas all in the same context. Now, a few years ago, I was working for a network that was reinventing their whole brand to become a kind of men's lifestyle network. And amongst other things, I was asked to help dictate the new look of the interior of our offices, which is kind of weird considering I don't do that for a living, but it was super fun. And building images to make these mood boards made it much easier to see whether the stuff I was finding could even work together. I had started out thinking I'd have, you know, one definitive collection of images. And when I started putting them together, it became apparent that there were a few different things going on here that should exist totally independently. So each of these different sets started evolving out of that. Now, these were meant to be presented to a variety of people, so they're laid out and organized nicely, but you certainly don't have to go this far to get the benefits of it. Something you probably do want to take note of is that in each one, sometimes I'm showcasing an image as I found it, and sometimes I'm cropping in on something to focus on a particular aspect of it. Here, I thought this whole idea of antlers hung sparsely on a beat up wooden wall was pretty cool. And here, the idea is to literally have an old fender amp as an object, maybe as an end table or just as something to fill space. But there was other stuff in this image I didn't want, so I cropped it out. And here was an image of a chalk poster or logo or something, and I didn't want to imply the idea of doing a logo or of any particular words, just the technique of laying out typography in chalk on a black wall, because that looks pretty cool. I really like the entire combo of this glossy red high-tech road bike against matte black wall molding, but in this image, I just wanted to highlight this specific clean transparent lamp and not anything else about the background. Here, I'm just interested in these specific textures like this old crate wood or embossed dyed leather. And the mood board lets you kind of throw these elements in without knowing exactly how they're going to be used. So you can keep mulling them over while you work on the actual project. And at the same time, you can throw in really specific things. Like, I figured if we had the budget, we could buy an old motorcycle, get it cleaned up, and put it in the lobby just for shit, because that would be super rad. So in each of these sets, I included a motorcycle I thought would look awesome in that setting. And in this one, I couldn't find the perfect bike, so I cropped this photo to indicate the qualities I did like, and you just get the feel for clean leather and polished metals and sharp black and white details. So for a given project, you might find images that are inspiring, but only for a few of their qualities. Given these two images, you might have only been drawn in by their contrasting textures and nothing else about their content or aesthetic, like the sleek angular stuff happening here, or the rich ornamental textiles here. Or maybe you focus on how an image is constructed, like with this photographic element paired with something graphic, or the really illustrative organic shapes of these tattoos against skin. Or you can pull color combo ideas and apply them to radically different kinds of images. You may have noticed that most of these images have very little to do with design or motion graphics, even though that's what I'm personally most involved with. And that's intentional. I don't want someone else's motion graphics ideas because those are their ideas and they've already been done. There was something I mentioned before about the value of unique input and having unique experiences. Part of what that means is looking elsewhere for that input. If you're a filmmaker, look to film, but absolutely look elsewhere too. If you're a designer, look at what other designers are doing, but also look at architecture, music, writing, and photography. Look at all of the arts and then look outside of even those too. You know, if you want animation ideas, look at the movement of pedestrians as they flow around stationary objects, or how jet trails catch the light at sunset. You know, you don't have to be the kid from American Beauty crying over how beautiful a plastic bag caught in the wind is, but you certainly can if that's exciting to your idea maker. So I tend to look at sites focused on stuff outside of my own industry. As an example, this site, The Black Workshop, is really just some guy's image blog about whatever affluent lifestyle stuff he's into. It's really hipstery, but I like his taste in photography, and there's a lot to look at here. If you were on a project, in a rut, thinking about shiny cubes or whatever boring bullshit your head usually goes to, you're not thinking about that now. It's a really good jog for the brain. Similarly, Death Junkie is curated by a single person, but with much different tastes and interests. 
you know, it's a, it's a mix of art and sex and moods and statements, so, you know, shield your sweet little eyes if you're easily offended, because this is basically a stream of consciousness, which is partly why there ends up being some really interesting stuff here. Unfortunately, it's not updated super frequently, but there's a pretty hefty backlog to go through. Otaku Gangsta is another one with yet again a different sampling of interests. Whoever this is is into like art, Japanese culture, nerdy robot shit, futuristic military stuff, and his taste in general differs from these other ones. You, know, you can sort of see how looking at this puts you in a slightly different headspace. When you're looking at these images, your mind is engaged in thinking about stuff it probably wasn't a minute ago. Draw Crowd is another image pile, but it's very focused on illustration and concept design, which can occasionally reveal some really cool stuff. It's all uploaded by users, so it's not curated in any way, but I found some really jaw-dropping stuff here. ArtStation is a similar site I just found with piles and piles of illustration, concept art, modeling, etc. It maybe hits a little close to home, but there's a lot of great work to admire here. Look at this guy. What is that? Come on, seriously? That's awesome. There's so much stuff to look at here. I don't know very much about it, but uh, it looks pretty cool. So here's Contemporous, which is another of probably a million design and architecture blogs that basically help you see what people who have more money than you are doing with it. Pretty cool though, if that gets your juices squirting. It's great for shapes and textures and different kinds of structures and spaces and forms. Mr. Cup is a blog that used to be called The Graphic Exchange, and it's almost entirely a print design collection, but it's pretty excellent. Lots of beautiful and thoughtful stuff showcased here. Lots of typography and textures and presentational ideas. So I'll go ahead and make all these links available if you're interested, but you probably already have some go-to sites that you like, or I hope you do. There's so many out there, it'd be hard not to stumble on enough to suit your own tastes. And you can use these things to get your head pointed in new directions when you need to. But the greater point is that the things you're looking at regularly are gonna naturally inform the kinds of things you come up with when it's time to do a project. The more exploring you do, the more unique and personal your collection of inspiration will be. And when it comes time to do a project, your ideas about it will be more unique and likely more authentic because they come from personal interest and experience. And that is how you develop your voice, which is really the most valuable thing you have. We'll talk more about that some other time, but for now, one of the most powerful things you can do for yourself is to start looking at things you weren't looking at before and learning to appreciate them in some way, to get some value out of them, and to keep doing that as you refine your interests. Keep learning and evolving those interests. Keep moving forward. Be the renaissance man. Be the scholar king. Give your mind what it needs to make great things. Now, whether you know this stuff already or not, we all get off track and find ourselves in creative ruts occasionally. So remember to use these things to keep you on track and feeling inspired. Now, just a quick note, I've been working on another of these videos for quite some time. It's based on a real world project, sort of like the first storyboarding video is. But this one's really big, and the goal is to end up with a fully animated and finished piece at the end. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about how it's turning out. I think it's going to be super cool, and I want to try doing something a little different. I want to make it something you can buy super cheap. It'll come with source files and project materials so you can really dig in deep and use for your own purposes if you like. And if it works out okay, I might be able to spend more time doing these so they come out quicker. So let me know your thoughts on that, and I'll keep working on it. And in the meantime, enjoy!